All right, so I'm going to try to, uh, first of all, thank you all for joining up today. Just for, just something kind of impromptu. Thought it'd be fun to um, get some questions from you all. And I got to make sure I stay on the waiting room. Let's see if I get everybody. Yeah, I just thought it'd be fun to check out what's on your mind and see if I can help you all with some questions. I'm going to try to get to a lot of these. I probably won't be able to get to everything. And maybe we'll put, um, <laughs> I will op optimistically say, let's just keep this at a half an hour. But there's no way that's going to happen. Um, we'll probably go more than that because uh, we'll start talking. Um, so here's how I kind of want to do this. Uh, we'll maybe, I have, I don't know, maybe six or seven people that we can watch their videos. And then I'll give a little bit of a, idea of um, uh, give you a little bit of an idea of how I would discuss these if you guys were in something like a trumpet mastery or USC or something like that these one minute check-ins uh, and then what I'll do um, the only distinction I will say that's that's different obviously is that um, people at USC and people that are in my trumpet mastery course I, I know them well you know we've gone through these checklists of what their strengths and weaknesses are what their character strengths are and um, I have an idea of what the routine is like. So the only difference here is that many of you I don't know, and I'll just be getting the only information will be what you show me here. So uh, some of it will be maybe um, less personalized and more general. Uh, because one of the things that's so important, first of all, can you all hear me totally fine? Okay, great. One of the things that's super important in our journey as trumpet players and trying to learn about what our next step is it, as individuals one of the most important things is context right um, you could go to um, you could go to driving school and you didn't look at the sign out of the front but it said nascar driving well that would give you a different i you know if you didn't really realize that that was the context then that would be your only experience of driving so but you're like i don't want to be a nascar driver i just want to drive on the street so Sometimes we have to really understand the context of information we're getting. Um, so some of the stuff I might say to you all will be without context because I don't know you. Okay, that being said, it looks like we have, this is a good number of people. So why don't we get started? Um, so I'll, I'll give, we'll go through maybe five or six things and then I'll answer a few questions that you all had. And then why don't we just open it up? Maybe you all have some just general questions or follow up ideas. Uh, from some of the comments I had. Sound good? Cool. Alright, so let's get started. So what I'll do is I'll share a video of somebody playing and then I'll comment on it as if um, I was just here in my room uh, giving feedback. So we're gonna start with, let's see, if, let me pull this up. We're gonna start with, um, oh he doesn't have his name here. Uh, sorry, let me pull up the name. We're going to start with some Charlie A2 by Luis. Is Luis here? I don't know. Uh, too many windows. Is Luis here? Yeah. Is that you, Luis Lopez? He's not answering. Okay, we'll listen to him anyway. So this is some Charlie A2. Let me share this screen with you all. Here we go.
Great, very nice. So, ah, hold on, let me mute. <laughs> hold on a second. Some of these automatically go to the next thing. Did you all hear that? I don't think you did. <laughs> um, all right, so Luis, thanks for your submission. And in and, and general, very nice playing. Um, so the Charlier 2, beautiful thing, beautiful melodies. And um, I would compliment you, first of all, on, I don't know you, but your setup looks pretty good. And it sounds like you're pretty balanced. This is a question some of you had about trumpet playing is sort of the balance of the chops. And so I would say that looks pretty good. You look like you're pretty connected with the instrument. So that's, that's a real positive. Um, and when it comes to playing Charlier 2 or these kinds of things, there's a lot of character here, a lot of potential nuance that we can access as trumpet players. And so what I would encourage you to do is go past the trumpet playing, go past the idea of what it is like to stay balanced, which you're doing a good job, but sometimes um, we want to not sound like a trumpet player. So if I, um, if I'm doing something like um, trying to divorce myself from what's easy on the trumpet and what's really good musically, I have to think a little bit. So if I press into the sound, I'll have to turn my voice down a little here. If I'm going... I'm pressing into it. And so... So what I would encourage you to do, Luis, is notice where some notes come out easier and when some notes come out harder and that you're not making your musical decisions upon that. Um, the, and the second comment I would say is if you were playing this for a, an American audition, um, this probably would be your one or two opportunities to show uniqueness and your more uniqueness in your musicality, right? So, um, in an audition, you might have an etude, something like this, or like a Charlie A6, or something like that, um, and then you'd have a bunch of excerpts. And the excerpts we have to sort of fall a little bit more in line, right? We're being much more critiqued on time um, and a little less on interpretation, but more of tradition to some degree. So with Charlie A2 or even something like the Haydn, you'll have more flexibility, but we have to still go along the same lines of um, musical expectation and delivery. So if you're coming into a rest, you're playing notes up into a rest and then the rest is longer than the notes beforehand, then that's a little bit difficult to convince somebody of. So even you're taking nice time and you're taking music, musical gestures, but this still has to fit into the framework of like the pacing of my sentences. If I talk like this and I set up the expectation that this is the rhythm that I'm talking in, that's fine. But if I give you that three times in a row, this is the pace that I've decided to talk in that's confusing musically. So no matter what you set up in your own personalized interpretation, when it comes to things like Charlie II, uh, where you have this more opportunity in audition, still take it with a grain of salt. And I think a little bit more straightforward is better than not. Great. So Luis, are you there? I don't if you had any follow up questions on that. Hey, Professor Houghton, I'm uh, George from Bulgaria. Uh, this video is mine. Uh, I'm sorry uh, to correct you. Oh, no problem. Uh, this video was mine. Oh, I see. Yes, I do have the wrong name. My apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for all your tips. Okay, any questions on that? Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you okay. so much. Okay, I'm sorry I got that mixed up. Okay, so let's keep going. Oh, wow, I just have way too many tabs open here. Okay, so the next one I want to talk about is from, um, this is Summon the Heroes. And I don't have the name right up here yet. Does somebody want to chime in who this is? Uh, here, I'll tell you. I think it might have been mine. Donnie? Yes, that's me. Okay. Great, so let's, let's hear Donnie play some summon. Once I find the tab, here we go. Okay. Oh, here we go.
Great, thanks Donnie, nice playing. Okay, so with this Summon the Heroes, what a great piece, my gosh. I miss playing this kind of stuff. Actually, we probably would be getting ready about now to play our John Williams program at the Bowl. Um, hmm. <laughs> all right, so this Summon the Heroes, and I noticed you, you all noticed he had, had a little reverb, right? Yeah, and so, I don't know you, Donnie, so I don't know how often you play with reverb. I have mixed feelings about this, and it's not good or bad. It's just like my colleague, Jim Wilt, he loves playing in boomy rooms. It relaxes him. He can hear intonation well. Um, I don't really like playing in overly boomy rooms. Um, being in COVID, I sometimes will practice with a little reverb because my room here is pretty small. And it is nice to have a change of pace, which is a question I'll get to in a little bit somebody else had about um, changing environments. But so with this, Donnie, I want you to tell me, well, I'll get, I'll get to your response in a second, but this is, this is some of the heroes. It is heroic. And I often like to make sure that my posture, my character is parallel to the character of the music. And so I think of these first three notes as jumping out. Ba -bum -bum. So I'm, I'm thinking of them as these are, this is a fanfare, ba -bum -bum. even though it's mezzo forte, it still has to have the character of nobility. And so um, let's make sure that we grab the t attention of the listener that you are the soloist voice right now. You are the, the character, the, the solo voice of this heroicism. Now, let's think another way about this musically. We're not gonna talk about chops in this particular example because uh, I think musically can help fix some things here. Have you ever watched somebody in the Olympics and you sort of like, you know, you all, are, you, your viewpoint of the camera, my camera is like the television camera and you see the person and they're about to like, they're about to do their thing. And you look at their eyes and you're like, where are they? You know, they're not aware of like, you know, like, oh, they're not doing anything like that. They're not really going like that. Their eyes are like somewhere else. You ever notice that? Absolutely. Yeah. And so how does this relate to music? How this relates to me is that my musical line is unending. My vision, my character, my emotional state in this is very far. And I never let up on the sound. So that might be something like this. <laughs> I'm holding on to the energy. It doesn't matter if I'm going up, if I'm going down. I'm thinking of the thread of energy being pulled from my chops or from my bell, and I'm never letting, letting that energy down. And so as you slow down, as you go up, as you go down, you're really thinking of keeping that connection, that sonic 
connection, that energy. And what I noticed you doing a little bit is sort of going in little pieces. Like, hey, hey. And we need to sort of be in character the whole time. Okay. That makes sense? Absolutely. Good. Absolutely. So any questions on that? Um, yeah, I think that the only question would, and obviously I, I'm guessing that if I were to have more connection and stay with the thread through the whole piece, my sound continuity or color continuity between the registers would be a little bit more consistent, right? Exactly. So exactly. That's, that was my point about the musical line will sort of make you look for better ways to stay in that. So you might notice like, is there a big jump or a big difference between an octave? You know, it might, this will be a little loud, but like, is it, is, are you changing? Is it Bob bear? You're changing sort of vowel way too much. Okay. You could talk a little bit about the gate, about, um, this is something I'm gonna address in somebody else's question, but this idea of F P. I noticed, you know, you have a little bit slightly unconventional thing going on, I think, if I noticed correctly. And we just want to make sure that we have access to the... <laughs> and I'm not <laughs> open too much. Gotcha. Just finding ways to stay connected like that will really help. Great, let's keep going. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be Robert Richardson. He's going to play the some fantasy villain. That's me. All right, Robert. Is that better? Is my voice a little yeah. better? Turn it up a little. Yeah. Um, what I was just talking about in terms of this, the chops and having sort of a, a gate, does that make sense to you, all of you that I can see? Does the yeah. gate, does the word gate seem weird? Uh, I mean, I, I get it, I get it. Yeah, so it's like your ability to manage the air that's leaving your body, basically, into mm -hmm. the form of an aperture, right? And so this is where context becomes a huge huge thing you know somebody might say oh man you got to be really loose here and you're like i can't play above the staff what do you mean loose and then somebody says like oh no you've got to have a nice small aperture you know you've heard people say that me i say that well which one is it am i loose am i small yeah you're loose and small and so what i noticed with you is that you, there's a little bit this is i'm going to be I'm throwing you under the bus here real quick, but the reason I picked your video is because you're struggling with some production things, yeah. right? Would you agree? Yes, yes. And so, so if I tried to emulate you, if we have a flat here and pushed up. And so you're having a little bit of a difficult time staying um, focused and pressure yeah. opens up the top lip and the bottom lip isn't supporting enough. So this is not going to be a quick fix. Um, yeah. And so it doesn't really fit under the paradigm of like, oh, here's your, if you were in a course that I knew you more, this I would much have much more supporting um, fundamental stuff to give you. But I would suggest that you start doing a little bit of side work with a little bit of lip buzzing, maybe mm -hmm. perhaps. 
um, a little bit below the staff, something like. Um, you ever do any lip buzzing? Uh, I have done some a little bit. And so you're going to want to think of, look at my profile. Uh, not like that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. You're going to want to start building some of the muscle memory of, if you ever watch this, um, ever look at videos of Harry James, or if you look at Hokan Hardenberger, if you look mm -hmm. at only Edward Ensonson, look at Doc Severinsen, even Doc Severinsen, he talks so much about being even, you know, mm -hmm. even able to connect from the top and the bottom. That's mm -hmm. really what I would suggest you do um, and do some sort of setup drills because you okay. struggle a little bit with the upper register, correct? Yes, yes. Yeah. And what's the first note of your day? Um, I, I usually, uh, I'll usually start with some lead pipe buzzing. Um, On low start or high? Low. Uh, I usually shoot for, I, I start lead pipe buzzing on C trumpet, usually go for oh. a G as my first. You do lead pipe buzzing on C trumpet? Yes. Interesting. Would You've you... never done it on B flat? Uh, I, I've done it on B flat some. I tend to go for C more. Why is that? Uh, my teacher mostly uh we've, we've been working a lot and he he prefers doing it on c trumpet and so i kind of have been yeah uh tending to do it there okay well of course listen to your teacher um mm -hmm. and, do you mind if i ask who that is uh it's danny talbenheim uh he plays oh, yeah, in san antonio something yeah, yeah. so in general for you all out there that are maybe wondering about setup drill you can do lead pipe on B-flat trumpet two different ways. I don't usually do it on C trumpet, but mm -hmm. I'm, he probably has a, a reason for this. But if you do the Bill Adam way, there's sort of getting that ninth. But what really helped me, Robert, was mm -hmm. doing some work setting up on the concert F. Okay. Trying to find that a little bit each day. It took me a mm -hmm. while, but you can tell how those notes flick out. You guys, you all notice that? Yeah. Okay, so then I would, this is the super shotgun version of this. And once I set up and get that easy, now I'm set up on a concert F. Mm -hmm. And so I get a little bit, I would sort of say, moving forward for you, Start experimenting with what it's like to start a little bit higher, a little bit easier, finding a way to look down at the low notes rather than always looking up for the high notes. Okay, okay. Good. Any questions? Um, not really, no. Uh, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and Robert, the other thing I would say is your future probably looks like having more support from the bottom lip. Yeah, yeah. Have any of you seen this recent thing of Winton on Instagram? He's, I think he's playing um, Caravan, and he starts off with like super high. Anybody seen this recently? Nick has seen it. Jake has seen this. Look at look at Witten's bottom lip. It's like he's he, it's like he is. It looks balanced and even, and he can sort of take the airstream and go, not forcefully, but set up here in a very supportive way that he can mess around with this gate. So something to think about, Robert, more support from your bottom lip to help alleviate the pressure on that top lip. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Great, great. All right, let's keep moving here. Um, I want to let me take a small break here and talk about four questions that people had, and then we'll get back to uh, some videos. Somebody had asked about style neutral schools. Um, and I don't know if that person is here. It, it doesn't matter really, but I thought this was an interesting question. They were from Peru, I think, and they said, I want to go to somewhere that has a style neutral you know, entity. And I, I found it interesting because I kind of thought, well, shouldn't we go for the opposite? Shouldn't we go for some place that has really great style? that has an appreciation for all styles. And maybe that's what they're asking, but um, I thought it was interesting that 
that you wanted to go to style neutral. I think that's almost like saying, um, you know, always be objective. And it's just impossible. We have this, our environment, our cities, our countries are, are biased in our style and our characterizations. And I think it's rather than trying to be a vo void ourselves of them, I think it would be great for us to adopt them and try to understand what makes them all effective in a way. Yeah, just a thought. Somebody asked, I think this was Ryan, he had asked about uh, exercise and chops. You know, what, it, what do I think that makes a difference with exercising and chops? And like, if you are exercising, you're playing, and then you stop exercising, and then does that affect your playing? Is that kind of the question, right, Ryan? Oh, hold on. Your, your, your mic is really uh, robotic. <laughs> is this better yeah beautiful <laughs> yeah so it was just all about like balance um um finding balance here in terms of like working on our body um i, I guess like like does that have any effect on our shots and the balance within our our playing system at all like exercise in general yeah, yeah. um of course it does. Yeah. I mean, I think the more I remember I did my first recording uh, and I remember the producer said to me beforehand, you know, you got to make sure, you know, weeks and months ahead that you're exercising, that you're drinking lots of water, you're taking your vitamins. And I think she wanted me in t tip top form shape. So, of course, you know, the more healthy we can be more uh, you know, physically vibrant, I think, of course. But actually, I thought of a different thing when you were asking your question. Um, and I think this might be very uh, interesting for all of you that perhaps are switching gears from your, sur your summer environment to maybe your school environment or you, you were at home for the summer and then you went back to school even though you're still in a dorm or whatever. How many of you like in the last couple weeks or soon are going to change your environment like not home but going to somewhere else? All right, so if you, well Ryan you just did, you just moved, right? So. I think this is one thing that I noticed a lot of people had difficulty with at the end of this summer trumpet mastery. Right at the end, we were, were finishing up and a lot of people in the last couple of weeks were moving, going back home or, I mean, going from home back to school. And a lot of people started like sending me questions like, oh, my chops feel weird. It's like, oh, so what was it? I really think that we don't give enough uh, thought to how our environment conditions us for better for worse and so you can be in some room like this or you can play in the same room 99% of the time during the summer 95% of the time and then all of a sudden you move a lot of things change but now you're practicing in a different place that's giving you completely different feedback and your body wants to respond not consciously it's responding unconsciously you're like you may think, oh man, this doesn't sound right. And it actually sounds exactly like it did the day before when you were in a different city. But now this environment is giving you different feedback and you're reacting. And then what you start doing is you start overreacting. You start trying to fix it. You start trying to manipulate rather than holding on to good form. And so, Ryan, I wonder if some of that happened is that you changed your environment. You, you found yourself practicing in a different place and you were like, and your chops started feeling crappy a little bit after you got there. It wasn't maybe right away, I don't know. But just a thought that I think all of us should be considerate of um, in these transitioning times, especially when we've been locked in one place for a long time. So I don't know if that, if that answers your question, Ryan, but I think it's something for you to consider. Yeah, super helpful, thank you. Yeah, okay, and then two more questions. Somebody had asked, let me see, maybe I, I maybe I had their name wrong. But somebody was asking about balance between the lips. They said, you know, a lot of players, how many of you feel like your top lip takes more responsibility than the bottom lip? Or maybe responsibility is the wrong word. How many feel like your top lip gets beat up <laughs> compared to your, right. So um, this is definitely something that we can be aware of. And I think in the ideal situation, we want to find a real 
equilibrium between the top and the bottom lips. If, if we do find that too much responsibility, i.e. pressure, is on one lip, then you're going to have probably a much quicker end of the road kind of scenario from an endurance standpoint. Um, and a lot of ways we can do that is, is sort of thinking of this outer structure. One of the ways I've done this recently ta -da, is this guy. So. <laughs> trying to understand how the outer support system engages on a bigger mouthpiece, which maybe you don't know, Bud Herseth played baritone for like a year before he played trumpet. And then he also played trumpet, he also played baritone while he played trumpet because he got scar tissue here and he wanted to kind of loosen it up and he was doing some work um, to stay in shape to help keep this kind of flexible because there was scar tissue right in the middle of his face. So the baritone has really helped me engage this to find a way to stay balanced here. So just a thought. You could also just get a, a single mouthpiece just to notice how these points here are important to supporting this. Okay, and then um, let, let's go back to a couple videos here. Let's listen to, uh, I think Mr. Cole just showed up. Let's, let's see what Mr. Cole has to say. Let me find this video. Now that I have access. Okay, one second. Uh, share. Here we go. Hey. What's up, man? Long time MC. Um, from a lesson that we had a long time ago when uh, about a major ometer change for me, you said that I was too probably too open here and uh, I've been working hard on closing it down and because I have a big dip in my upper lip, Bobby Shoes suggested that I move the horn a little to the left, the non-dominant side. It's been kind of working. I've been getting sound. I've been able to play much higher uh, without pressure than I used to, um, but my articulations are completely blowing apart and it's not stable at all. And I, I know that you went through a big amateur change a long time ago and I was just wondering uh, what did you work on to stabilize and get those articulations happening? Um, help. Whatever. <laughs> I love the end. Whatever. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay. Um, so, good to see you, Stuart. Good to see you, man. Okay, so, what is this? So if you, you know, if you had sent me this video and, and you know, we were, again, in the, in the kind of, like, uh, consistent working environment, I would, the quick answer I would give you back is say, hey, what is articulation? You know, I, and I'd let you sit and think about that for a second. Articulation is the beginning of sound, right? beginning of sound. Articulation isn't, isn't something that um, we do with our tongue per se. Our tongue helps divide sound. So I sound like Christopher Walken, divide sound. <laughs> um, so two things to think about. When it comes to uh, especially upper register, you're exactly right. We had talked about this being a little too open and Bobby said move it over. Sure, that makes sense. And what we want to make sure is that this this is where I wrote the PF down, this <laughs> You know, Stuart, it might be interesting for you to take, you know, you know maybe you put the metronome at um, 200 and do for like, see how long you can do that. And so what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to develop this sort of the stamina, the mental stamina to um, Sorry, that's too loud. You want to be able to You want to be able to kind of taste those notes. 
Was the sound still too loud on that last thing? A little broken? I'm good. Okay. So, um, I got people waiting to get in. One second. Oh, they went away. They changed their mind. So, so Stuart, the, that, that's the one thing. I think you are getting that articulation in the middle register. So you want to want to work on support system to, to maintain that forwardness to keep that access. Now, here's the other thing that is going to be a little contrarian. You're playing a mouthpiece that's got a pretty damn big throat. And so one thing that is going to help us when it comes to playing with the instrument is understanding how do we find this equilibrium of balance and resistance, right? If we don't have enough inherent resistance to the instrument, then we are going to have to. You could be a freak like Winton, who's amazing at, at sort of, he's very structurally sound and can have that with a, a mouthpiece that probably has a bigger throat. He doesn't need that resistance because he's just optimal here. It's really easy for him to sort of control that uh, with the setup, the structure out here. But if you have this, things kind of get pushed open here because of excess tissue, you're going to want to make sure that maybe a mouthpiece with slightly more resistance could help you find a way to stay balanced. So just a couple of thoughts there. Um, and then the other, the last point I would say about articulation, and this is a little bit of a silly thing. I like talking about lip fry. Did we talk about this? No. Anybody here heard me talk about lip fry, Anthony? So, you know, you all know what vocal fry is, right? You're like, oh my God, <laughs> this California thing. Stuart, we, we know about this, right? So, yeah, all about <laughs> so there's something of, and look, this is super um, kind of casual talk. This is not nitty gritty. We could talk about nitty gritty, but it might not be, um, relevant for all of you, but just in a general sense, this idea of vocal fry, the lips respond and look almost similar to the vocal cords and how it grips the airstream. So if our lips, if our vocal stream or our, our vocal cords can't grab the airstream, then we can go a, 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 we go, Hey, Hey, and we don't, you feel that kind of lack of resistance and lack of enunciation which is the beginning of sound which is articulation are, are y'all following me on this <laughs> it's making sense so the vocal fry sometimes is a funny way for us to see do i have access to the uh, 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 like my vocal cords do on a higher note so it might sound like this like a very um accentuated p attack but you're just testing to see if you have access to uh, this lip fry. So you can get in the middle register. And if I, if once I get it, if I can get it like on a G on top of the staff with kind of, um, being able to grab the note in a gentle way. Now, of course, I never play like that, but I have access to that as a sort of litmus test for my general setup. Does that make sense? No? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, what's up, Matt? Do you have a question about that? So, uh, so what are you exactly are you doing to make that sound <laughs> or like I'm just okay, I get the concept, it, but I'm just not letting the air out My okay. gates put my gates pretty closed. Okay. I have access to shut the gate. I can shut it All right, does that make Thank sense you. Stuart? Yeah, no, I totally don't understand but I don't want to hold you up that sounds really interesting <laughs> Well, <laughs> well, we can just here, here's a couple ways for all of us to test to see like how much general um, control do we have, and especially in the upper register. If you all, since you're all unmuted, if you have your trumpet there, you can try this. Um, let's see. I think I, I think you're all muted. Yeah. So 
let's just see how easy is it for you to play a G on top of the staff and and then play finger G sharp and stay on that G like this. In piano. Go ahead and try that. So Stuart, you were able to do this? Oh, can you show us? Oh, you're muted. Yes. You're muted. <laughs> Good. Unmute. There Got it. Go. Okay. Forgive me. good now the only other thing that's a little bit tricky with this is because your throat is so big it helps you have this kind of access to this it helps you sort of there's there's not sort of this resistance point that's making you have that control so how, did, how many of you had trouble when you went to finger the G sharp to stay on the G you flicked all over the place yeah it was like you were kind of going like this How many of you did that? Right. So this is just one way, Stuart, for you to sort of um, maybe try doing this a little bit higher and always soft to try to bring in the ability to capture the airstream in a balanced way so that you have good articulation in the upper register. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, let, let's do one more, everybody. Let's see. Um, so many choices. I so appreciate all of your submissions. Uh, let's do, I don't think he's here, um, Chris Vubolt. Are you here, Chris? If he's not here, then maybe we won't do him. Forget him. Hey, you want to see a funny video? Let's watch this one. This is by a tuba player. Um, it's always easy to laugh at tuba players. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Here we go. Hey, so I don't play the trumpet. <gasps> but I am playing trumpet music, Charlie A8. And uh, my question is, do you have any tips for navigating these uh, intervals uh, of a fourth uh, that happen at the tempo one section about two thirds of the way down the first page, looking to use less motion and be more efficient. I think that will apply to all brass players, trumpet, tuba, whatever. <laughs> Thanks for that submission. How many of you have worked on this Charlie A8? Great. So yeah, it's a little bit of a tricky spot. And so in general, how many how many of you use the Vizuti book? Great. So one of the things I love in the Vizuti book is number six in Vizuti book one in the slur section. Very similar to this right here. And so <clears throat> what I would say uh, to anyone who's working on this is that he has very good, you have very good centering of your notes when it's lyrical and oftentimes when it's moving. It's very nice. You can hear this sort of clear, resonant center. But when you start moving, it's a little bit like that video of somebody putting a 50 pound weight inside of a spin cycle of a dishwasher or, you know, a washing machine. It starts off and then the thing just completely destroys itself. So what we want to do in general, um, now of course it's different for tuba player because they're moving a lot more tissue, but for us as trumpet players, we want to 
start to learn how to, like to use his word, navigate between different intervals with as little movement as possible. Because then the more movement there is, the more complication there is, the more um, difficult it is to do it with speed and ease and efficiency. And so when it comes to those intervals, something like this, he's playing it in a different key, uh, but I developed this little exercise for intervals that I'll share with you all. It's very simple, but it's psychological and it's physical. So what you do is you, let's say you want to do an interval from the first note, F, and that C to F is going blah, 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 blah. You're getting a lot of um, partials in between, or at least one. So we start identifying linear, like consistently playing in the instrument. That's step one. Now, step two would be, I'm going to finger a half step, but still play the long tone. Step three is that I will do a bend of a half step um, with the fingering. And then I play it. So then you keep going with the intervals, always doing a half step bend. So we'll do this fourth, which is what he's asking about. And this, I'll do the four step process with the idea of um, fingering, but not playing it. And then so then I'm starting to do the interval in the same manner that I did the half step bend. Make sense? I've got a question. Donnie. Yes. Um, so when you're doing these uh, here, so slurs, um, are you changing your syllable at all? Are you going e ya e ya at all, or just ooh the whole time? Um, there is tongue movement. I'm not going to say that there's no tongue movement, and there. This is this is a little. It's a great question, Donnie. This is a little tricky because depending on how efficient you are with the aperture will depend on how much tongue movement is beneficial. Okay. The more efficient and connected we are here, minimal movement will yield more flexibility if you tend to be less efficient here and you really depend on tongue movement you can do it there's probably going to be a, a a brick wall in the future of like how fast you can do big intervals that's why number six in jazuti is a great exercise <laughs> trying to get none of this I'm getting that. Yes. Yeah. So you all check out that exercise and try to get no partials in there. And you'll start to realize uh, some of the things I'm talking about will really help you slot between those. Great. All right. And uh, there was one other thing I wanted to answer somebody's question. Um, yeah. I mean, it was just a general question that Matt had about organization. You all don't probably know too much about this in my teaching style, but I, I'm personally, I'm not the most organized person in the world, but I was maybe just barely smart enough to realize that for me to get better on trumpet, I had to be organized at least with trumpet. And so um, Matt was asking how organized am I for planning my day, planning my week? Um, and Matt, I wouldn't say that I plan to a point of rigidity that doesn't allow me to listen and be flexible, but there is enough, I would say it's more observation and documenting what I'm doing than it is saying, I will play this at this minute, or I will do this all day. Um, I allow myself to be flexible and have really good form in what I'm doing. And then I start noticing if there's too many things that I'm not fit into. But I will say this, my teaching is evolving as I, work with more people and I evolve myself as a player, um, you can do a lot of great things in simple exercises. So for example, one thing I was working on last night is a, a great book by 
Chris Gecker. Do you all know this book? Slow practice. And so all the things I'm talking to you about, about gauge and being able to connect and stay balanced and stay, <clears throat> what we really need is opportunities to let those seeds grow, these ideas grow, these kernels of greatness to grow. And so something like slow practice on all sorts of intervals like this, having, having good articulation in the middle register and then transferring that every half step all the way up till I'm on concert E. That seems like, oh man, it's mind-blowingly boring. But what you're actually cultivating there could be better than running through 53 different uh, scale patterns and arpeggios and stuff like that. So I allow myself to go deep on really good concepts. And then I notice in my practice chart, um, I notice in my practice chart, what am I missing um, over time so that I don't get some things totally neglected um, when it comes to staying balanced in a week. And now it's different. I'm sure you all have experienced a real shift when COVID started. And then maybe if you're back now, maybe you're playing in ensembles and now you're like, whoa, this is different now. So if you have a lot of playing responsibilities or you have to start jumping through a lot of hoops with school or maybe a job, then a practice chart and, and noticing what you're doing over a period of time can be really helpful to keep you on track and not to go off into left field just because of the environment you're in. That's really something that I got good at with the LA Phil when we were normal. I knew how to stay balanced. Um, and now I've let myself kind of get out of balance because I'm going deep in a couple areas. But, all right, everybody. So how about just a couple minutes for just general questions? Um, thank you again so much for your submissions. Um, I love seeing a familiar faces, um, some new faces. Um, so any questions just to wrap things up here in a few minutes? Um, yeah, I had one. Jared, yeah. Um, I, sorry, I think you probably saw it, but it was just about like keeping the feeling of your chops being consistent day to day. Sometimes I have days where I feel really good and other days, next day I feel really weird. So if there's any tips you could give for that. Yeah, thanks. So. Some, so is it that you maybe have a hard day and then the next day feels bad or is it just randomly you just feel like, wow, I can't find this today? Um, sometimes it can be a little bit of both. So like, you know, someday I might have a hard day and then I'm, I'm feeling uh, kind of bad the next day or I feel really good that day. So I play a lot, you know, and then the next day it kind of, right. you know, right. So there's our pedagogical understanding of this is becoming much much better and and as our understanding of how to manage this better from a teaching standpoint it improves it also needs to respond and react to our social environment that we're all dealing with and what i mean is what is the expectation of what we're going to achieve in a day this is difficult right because so many parts of our society is so immediate. I know I sound old saying that, but the truth is like, we're slowly losing the sense of what it takes to cultivate something over years. I was talking to John Hagstrom last night, second trumpet in Chicago Symphony. And he was saying he was, he'd been working on this one exercise for seven years. And he's like, in the last couple of months, he's like, I really feel like I got it. So when's the last time we all worked on something for that long? So to answer your question, Jared, um, we try not to go, you know, we're playing in the green zone, which some days you see like, it feels really great. And you're like, great. And we go, we push it to the yellow zone and then we push it to the red because we're trying to keep, I want the green to go longer when that that's fine. But now you spend time in the red, which are bad habits. You're pushing, you're tired. You can't have good form when you're exhausted. Um, so it's time to put it away. Maybe you do listening. Maybe you do some transposition exercises. Maybe you do some sight singing. Maybe you do some finger work. 
and make sure that you're giving your you're not going to that red zone every day to where the next day you actually physically have hurt yourself I remember Hokan saying something to the effect of he'll get this to be respond respond very easily with good structure supporting that and then he tries to hold on to that as long as he can throughout the day and so back when he was probably in his late teens early 20s um, he was probably doing things like the slow practice work for hours a day hours building a substantial foundation of support around a beautiful delicate flower that is this and it's it's easy to sort of like for somebody to take that for granted but like I don't think most of us do that right so I would say notice here, here's a good way to describe this. Let's say, how many of you have arm wrestled before? Yeah, Stuart's like, eh, not proud of it. <laughs> okay, so, you know, if you start out here, like, ready, one, two, three, go! And you, you stay here, you feel pretty strong, right? You're like, hey, this is good. If you get here, you feel what? Even stronger. You're like, leverage is going the right way, it feels great. Now, what happens? just ever so slightly the the person gets the upper hand a little bit what happens to your form does your arm feel good do you feel stronger how much strength is it going to take you to get back to neutral a lot more than it did to get to here and so if you spend too much of your time here this way your arm starts to hurt what happens to your legs they start searching for ways to support your upper body all these other things start coming up to try to support and they might not be the things you want to support now you're learning how to do that and a lot of us learn how to play a long time with bad habits I think that's normal we all have a different balance of that but for you Jared I would say notice when you've lost your form steer your attention to somewhere else to try to stay healthy and trust that over time you will get better and better endurance of great form rather than um, compromised and then you'll be able to access that good form each day consistently as opposed to you know overreacting kind of good bad good bad and then you have to find it again sometimes it takes a long time great gotcha. somebody Thank had you. a question down here can you talk about the balance of the tulips yeah at least we talked about this a little bit um just staying balanced you can you'll I will put this video I think on Facebook and you can look at it but not to repeat for our friends here but staying balanced this way X and Y axis is really important I've been doing a little bit more facial exercises just bringing awareness to different parts of the body uh, so that I can help engage them um, most people that are amazing players they have good symmetry not all I mean there's some great players that don't have good symmetry but most you look at Doc you look at Harry James you look at Hokan the list goes on there's a degree of symmetry almost like four points and if we start losing that the lips cave in um, jaws too far open then we start having points of excess pressure one points taking the responsibility of three and that's that gets a little dangerous alright let's do one more question then we'll call it a day oh Stuart did you have a follow-up on that you're muted uh, you're you're muted uh, okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, for the four points of symmetry that you're talking about, um, I have a I have a pretty big overbite. So for people mm -hmm. that already have, and also like the dip in my upper lip. So, um, how, how does that factor into yeah. your? So, symmetry? it's a great question. Um, so what we want to do is this. even though you might have an overbite we want to make sure that this place where the teeth and the lip that that's a good that's a really great place for you to manage this bigger you know this sort of airstream that uh, relatively speaking to the trumpet is like way too much it's way too big so this this gate is a, a way for you to manage that despite the the teeth being down here managing this does that make sense yeah I think so that, that'll really help sort of. 
Yeah, somehow I mean, it does. It's just, I mean, you don't want this. If the overbites, your teeth come down, then this has nothing. Then there's like pushing here. But the second it, look at my facial structure when that happens. If I go like this, but I get the bottom lip a little, uh, touching close to here. See that? Yeah. Something to experiment with a little bit. All right, one last question, then you all enjoy your Friday. I hope you're enjoying this. <laughs> I got another question. Yeah, Donnie. Um, my question is about uh, consistency and accuracy. Mm -hmm. And how do you uh, foster that? How do you work on that? Yeah, there's lots of different ways that people are great at this. Um, one is the physical side, and I think a second one is having a wicked good ear. You know, some of you in here probably have exceptional ears, and that drives your ability to be accurate. Um, so I, in all full disclosure, um, I have okay ear. You know, I could always work on it better. I'm sure Stuart, he can play stuff, you know, pick up a tune and play, no big deal. That's not really my forte. Um, I wish it was, but it's not. And so um, I address my strengths, I, I, I address my weaknesses, and I also work with my strengths. I'm really good at coordination and balance, this idea of like even just physical balance. And so um, I go about consistency and accuracy from two different ways. One, I always try to hear what I'm playing, but two, there's a degree of muscle memory that is paramount in my ability to um, pick off certain notes or remember the sensation of a certain interval. And so this is where fundamentals become um, really important. And I'm not, uh, I don't have a trick and I don't have a unique approach to every excerpt or every solo. I want them all to be really dang similar in terms of my approach. So if my approach, if I get so fixated on working, this is why I, I kind of tended to steer students away from like, hey, go do NTC. Not that it's a bad thing, but don't let this one solo make you skip steps to be able to play it. And I kind of would make rather that we work on fundamentals like arpeggios and intervals and single tonguing and double tonguing and how they all mix together, like muscle confusion in a way. Make sure that we're building uh, an entity that has access to these all things in a simplified, unique way. Um, so where I think people find that they miss notes a lot is that their approach changes. And so they might approach an interval in Charlier one way, but then that interval comes up a different way in the Tomasi. And so they approach it a different way. And now it's like, wow, this feels confusing. That why This is a no big deal interval. Yeah, because you learn to do it very myopically in the Charlier, and it doesn't work for the Tomasi. So th those are a couple of different ways I would say. Um, because it, it, in my job at the Phil, <clears throat> normally, you know, I'm jumping through hoops all week long. Um, there might be times where I have three recording sessions at Sony. I go, I play three concerts at the Phil. I'm teaching, and I also have a chamber music concert all in the same week. And you're like... I can't have a different way of approaching all these different intervals or we'll call them obstacle courses, right? They're all different kind of obstacle courses. Like the, in the Sony session, it's like, bum, 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 and that's it. Well, I can't approach that differently than something else because otherwise that's going to feel like completely foreign to me. So I try to be, um, uh, I try to have a good fundamental base, hear, hear it, and then have good muscle memory of intervals and sort of a straightforward, simple way of approaching all things. Awesome. Thank you so much. All the way back into the breath. I hope you all are doing breathing exercises or something like that because that's where it starts. Does that make sense, Donnie? I mean, a Absolutely. lot of times people will take a shallow breath for something and then they'll take a deep breath for something else just because of where it is. And that's, that's dangerous, I think. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Great. You all are awesome. One well, last short question about the U. Yeah, George. One well, last short question about the U.S. How will be the audition be held for the next academic year for an undergraduate uh, admissions, live or online? 
you have information about that? About for me or my uh, USC or just in general? Uh, for the Trump undergraduate music program in the USC. Oh, USC. Yeah, we, <laughs> we're not sure. Um, I don't think many places know what's going on with their auditions. Uh, it looks like many of you are in college or at least recently graduated. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess right now. I have no idea. Um, as soon as, you know, as soon as we know, um, though I'm sure there'll be an announcement, but I'm guessing that there's going to be a lot of recorded material. Um, it's hard to imagine that things are going to improve in the next couple of months with flu season coming around, that kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the material, the material should be relatively the same. So whatever's up on the website now, we haven't really changed it in the past. It's kind of a general thing of a, you know, contrasting etudes and a solo and that kind of thing. Pretty straightforward. Great, everybody. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I really appreciate it. You all, I hope you're staying healthy. You're staying well. And as a side note, I hope you're staying mentally healthy. Um, for me, this has been a, been a challenge and a silver lining in a lot of ways too. But, you know, balancing a lot of the things like kids, work, um, connecting and downtime has been a challenge. And I just encourage you all to um, take care of yourselves and, you know, a little meditation, a little bit of um, respite from uh, what could seemingly be a very anxious filled time. So please stay healthy and safe and, and thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. So best of luck to you all guys. Take care. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, man. Thanks, Tom. Thank you.